Hello, everybody. Hi. I'm Amy Dyer. I uh, work with Harvey Hubble. Welcome to the second Litchfield Farmers Forum. Hello to all of you who are Zoomed in. The last we counted, there were 27 people logged on. Thank you so much for joining. Strange times with COVID. Um, so we have a lot to go over today, and we're really happy and pleased to have so many people here um, to help us uh, with feedback and as experts and to help share their guiding wisdom as we navigate through the waters of trying to figure out regulations for Litchfield and hearing from people, but also learning a little bit more about the resources that we have available to us. And we will be recording this meeting like we did last time, and we'll be sharing it on YouTube as well as through our Facebook page uh, so that people will be able to access it. Not everyone was able to come. We have the farmer's market happening this morning at you know, sometimes people have to get home, unpack, make their way here, and not everyone was able to make it, but we did our best to accommodate um, with the scheduling and the timing to make that happen. Okay, so I am gonna be helping manage the Zoom Lounge. Uh, we've got support here with Kelly and Jillian who are helping monitor people who are coming in who do have questions, and then Harvey will be here helping. Uh, with his hat, top hat on and microphone so that if people do have feedback in the room, he will clean the microphone and pass it out to you. And then all of you guys have microphones that you're connected to. Okay. So without further ado, why don't I introduce you to Harvey and let him begin the introduction. Thank you, Amy. So yeah, so Amy and I are like the resident pen and teller of the Wisdom House today and Sonny and Cher of the Wisdom House. So I appreciate everybody being here today. You took time to come here, and that's really important, but we have some important things to do here. And um, as Amy said, people, it's recorded, so people are gonna be watching this. Even though the people that are here, the people that are Zooming in, more people are gonna be watching this. This is what they did with the last one. So it's all about information, and we have a lot of information here today. So we have our guests up here, and uh, they're gonna tell us who they are, what they do, and they're gonna give a brief trend of what they see. Joan, you first. Sure, so good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here again. Um, thank you, Harvey, for the invitation. So my name is Joan Nichols. I'm the Executive Director for Connecticut Farm Bureau Association. We are a private nonprofit uh, based in Wethersfield, Connecticut. We represent nearly 2,500 farm families in the state of Connecticut. And the reason that I'm here today and to help um, the town of Litchfield is we've been in Connecticut for 101 years and in the role that I have at Connecticut Farm Bureau we have realized that we have to advocate on the federal and state level for farms and agriculture in order for you to be sustainable and thriving in your communities but we also recognize that in Connecticut we also have to advocate locally to make sure that you have the tools you need and the farms have the tools they need to be able to grow the farms in your communities. And in Connecticut, we have 169 sets of municipalities and all have their own sets of zoning regulations which can regulate certain activities that occur on farms. So I'm here today to help the farmers in Litchfield and the town of Litchfield help navigate how to develop ag-friendly zoning regulations. So thank you, Harvey. Hi, I'm Karen Kalinowskis. I'm president of Litchfield County Farm Bureau, and we operate a family farm in Watertown. Um, we have a beef, sheep, uh, sorted small livestock. And this year, uh, with the things that have happened with food and people knowing where their food is. We had enough demand and we opened a on the farm market for beef, lamb and fiber. And um, I think it's really important that um, people that are, there are a lot of people that have been in farming for a very long time and there are, we have a lot of new people coming to farming. And I think it's really important to know that there's an organization like Farm Bureau um, there's, if you do not have connections with a, an agency or the kind of product that you're growing, uh, it's really important to, to have those kinds of, of networks, but really and truly in terms of farming, 
um, activities. Uh, Farm Bureau is the voice that we have in Connecticut, and it is an amazing job uh, that is done um, making sure that farming is advocated, and we're also watching many of the kinds of things that are happening at the state level in terms of regulation. Um, we need someone watching so that there are regulations, and Connecticut Farm Bureau um, really does a fantastic job of doing that, and with your membership, you're kept up to date with things that our legislators and our senators really need to hear about from the farmer's perspective. Thank you, Karen. John. Well, I'm sitting next to Joan and Karen, and I, but yet I feel like uh, the 1992 vice presidential candidate, James Stockwell, when he said up on stage, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a retired high school teacher, 33 years, mostly environmental science, and the pandemic changed everything, duh, right? So I was escorted to be the president of the Litchfield Land Trust, and my friend at White Memorial, James Fisher, and I uh, coordinated a pollinator pathways uh, initiative where we reached out to 150, 200 people locally we had, by carrying on different Zooms and webinars, uh, one through uh, a cooperative extension with UConn. I'm doing one with the White Memorial, uh, not White Memorial, but with the uh, community center uh, in a month. So I, my interest in biodiversity has been, you know, I, it's been uh, stimulated by, by this work. And, you know, because I really can't do anything else. <laughs> and uh, so it, I've had this big interest in, uh, for many years, by, motivated and inspired by the work of Doug Ptolemy to, to plant and grow native plants right at the uh, Litchfield High School campus, creating a, a, getting grants for uh, a mini nursery. Well, I connected with Harvey and the folks at Chanticleer Acres, and uh, we're going to be growing plants there as well. We're going to be installing some pollinator gardens. Um, and as agriculture moves forward, I guess I'm, I'm interested in seeing how farmers uh, evolve to, with, with biodiversity in mind. I have no expertise in this. I just have an interest. I can grow native plants, but I have no agricultural experience except my, my father who thought he was a farmer. <laughs> but um, so this is, this is what I'd like to see, uh, local, vibrant agriculture, uh, with with diversity in mind, biodiversity in mind. So that's that's where what I'm here for, and I so I pass Thank it on to Ben. Thanks, John. Buck. Uh, ben Buck, Sustainable Litchfield Committee, uh, which is part of a uh, which is a Litchfield Town Committee, uh, recently formed that, uh, to support best practices in Litchfield and. Um, we are engaged with, uh, we have a whole section of uh, actions that we're taking to support the agricultural part uh, of Litchfield. And um, that's how I got involved with coming here today. Um, so there's a range of actions depending on the feedback and the types of things that I hear uh, from today that could lead our committee forward into supporting uh, the farmers and the agriculture in Litchfield. Um, I, on the committee is the first selectman, Denise Rapp, also Jeff Zulo is on our committee. So the selectmen are very involved with this committee and they're listening. So um, that's why I'm here, to take this in and find out what, your, what, what the farmers' concerns are and how we can help uh, with our committee, Sustainable Litchfield. Ben, thank you and thank you everybody for making your time to come here. I'm going to go ahead and read what Amy has uh, written in on chat right now. Um, to the best of my ability, I will try to read this, and maybe that's the way we'll have to take it from here. So Amy Fusco joins us. We've got <laughs> quite a team with us, and she says, I'm happy to let producers know about the farmers.gov. She works with the USDA FSA, which is the Farmers Service um, associate, uh, Association. And... Um, so farmers.gov is a website that producers can access anytime to see their current programs and deadlines. 
The site is full of information and tools that producers can utilize in order to grow their operation and conserve resources, manage their risk, and discover disaster assistance, as well as loan programs. There are additional links related to resources. For instance, when you're looking at the disaster programs, you'll find a link to FEMA, SBA loans, as well as American Red, Lo Red Cross, and disaster-related resources. You'll find the links to our forms and applications, as well as eligibility criteria, um, all on the website, uh, which is near your nearest FSA field service. I actually have a printout with resources available for that. Okay, we've got Denise here. So we've got Denise Rapp, who is our first select woman joining us today. Um, she is um, joining us to listen and learn from our area farmers, as well as to learn about our concerns that the farmers have and how our sustainable Litchfield Committee and work with you to form, work with us to form a partnership. So she values the hard work of farmers and wants to learn more about the town of Litchfield, how the town of Litchfield can help support the local farming community. Thank you, Denise, I'm glad you're here, and thank you guys for working with me online. Okay, terrific. All right, so that's, that's it for now. Okay, good. Let's go through, um, I just wanted to have a couple of more shout outs to make sure that everybody knows who else has been really kind of helpful here. We've got Bill Davenport with um, the Yukon Extension. Do you wanna just say a few words for a sec? Harvey will come over. Yeah, he's gonna come over with a microphone. Yeah, I'm Bill Davenport. I'm the Lishaw County 4-H educator with Yukon Extension. And I guess that my purpose here is just I'm very interested, obviously, in agriculture and farming and lifelong resident of Litchfield. But also, I need to remind everybody that Yukon Extension has a lot of um, experience and a lot of specialists that can help farmers and towns you know, navigate through some of the issues that you're going to talk about. Um, we have Rich Minert. He is the livestock and dairy specialist and also nutrient management specialist at UConn. Through UConn Extension, he works out of this Torrington office up at the former UConn Torrington branch. Uh, I'm the 4-H guy, but he does more of that. And also we have a, a greenhouse specialist, Leanne Punt, who is right here, who is a state, that both of them are statewide people, but they're located right here in Torrington. And there's over 110 extension specialists across the state, ranging from inner city food programs, nutrition programs to uh, coastal, um, aquaculture, um, information, foresters. So you kind of has a lot to offer and I just want to remind everybody that we exist. And I left a couple pamphlets over there if people want to find the number for the Yukon Torrington um, Extension Office to reach out to us, just a reminder that we're there to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, and I should also point out when Jocelyn was on earlier and she kept uh, looping back with her voice over and over again, totally not your fault, Jocelyn. Um, we've been asking Jocelyn certain questions and trying to, as we navigate our way through these waters and her one of her roles and I'm not an expert in this at all though is to be able to be on a little bit more of a regional level looking at um, various items related to regulations so that there you know she has a, a larger picture of what's happening in the region as opposed to just kind of a microscope on just one town Joan, did you have anything to add about your experience with Jocelyn? Maybe give a little bit more feedback about her role and what she's put together. Sure, and I'm really excited to have Jaz Jocelyn involved in today's meeting. Um, a few years ago, Jocelyn actually invited me over to um, the COG office in Goshen, and at the time there was a uh, we had a grant, some grant money from the Department of Agriculture, and we were helping with municipal outreach on developing ag-friendly zoning regulations and agritourism was was then about three years ago or so a really hot topic and obviously it's 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 really grown in its interest and so i was very excited to be invited by Jocelyn to do a presentation a few years ago before um some of the municipal leaders in this part of uh, litchfield county that were interested in trends in agriculture as well as what municipalities could do to 
develop regulations related to agritourism. So um, I was glad to be invited then, and I think Joslyn's a great resource for you as far as what your regional planning agency can help as far as guidance is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. She's also written in saying that NRCS is committed to helping protect long-term viability of farming while restoring, protecting, and enhancing our natural resources. We work with farmers on plans, and we do have financial assistance programs to assist and implement parts of those plans. And um, her region covers 21 towns. She works with local planning and zoning commissions, as well as supporting local farms. And um, they also support the Northwest Connecticut Food Hub. Many of you learned about the Food Hub last, seat, last um, Farmers Forum, but the Food Hub is really helping in many ways with food security in the area. Um, Renee Giroux is a big part of that. It comes with sustainable health communities. We actually have some paperwork over there, but at Chanticleer Acres, we grow food for the Northwest Food Hub as well. Thank you, Jocelyn. Okay. All right, and a response to you, Joan, is that she loved having uh, you come to present at the Local and Planning Zoning Commission uh, for those members and how to make their rigs more farm friendly. Excellent. So we also have Emily Armstrong. I'm not sure if she's had a chance to log in yet, but um, she is uh, with Johanna Hayes' office. They're really paying attention. They're trying to see what's happening in this town as well as some other local towns related to regulations, and she will report that back to the Department of Agriculture. And um, I think that's mostly it for right now. We might have Carolyn Marlowe also from the, USD, the USDA FSA. And Sephra Alexander, is she here yet? She's with CT NOFA, and we also probably have Patrick Haran joining us as well and zooming in. Are we good right now, Jillian? Emily Armstrong says a hello to everyone and she's here. Okay, so if we have a question, we'll just chat back and forth. Thank you, Jillian. Okay, so let's just take a quick moment to just take a look at our day. What time is it now? We've had a little bit of delay, 226. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about why we're here today. We're gonna have some open discussion back and forth so you guys have a chance to ask questions. Um, for those of you zooming in, just type it in. We'll do my best reading it and we'll you know, point it to who you want it to be the best answer for you, or we can help you with that. And then we're going to be um, going through and doing a little bit of um, research information dump on you guys, because we've had surveys, we have survey feedback, um, and we have more information to share with you guys along those lines, and we're keeping it all as open as possible. And then we'll have more Q&A, and then we'll just talk about where to go from here and what these next steps look like. So we were talking before with, with Bill Davenport about Goshen has these, this incredibly great two-day event where you go and you get to see all the different farms and all the unique farms. And so farms are not a cookie cutter. Farms are unique, and farms have also changed over the last few years. So what we want to, we need the council, and we need the brain trust to tell us, where are we going to be in 10 years from now? And how do we get there? We know that there's the town of Litchfield is, is there's 169 towns, and they all do things separately. So th this is the guidance we're looking for. Does anybody want to talk about where they are? I know, Vince, you want to start a beef, beef farm? Yep. Do you want to just talk about where you are? Hey, let me, let me uh, give you... Okay. Well, okay. My, my biggest problem was, basically, I, I wanted to start the farm, the beef farm. Uh, I do have a farm in New York on all the rules and regulation. In Connecticut, I got all kinds of stumbling blocks. I didn't know who to reach. I left a message. They didn't never call back. To give an example, what I'm looking for is who, who do I call when I want something, whether it's a form or whether it's uh, a form that has to come back to me. Uh, for instance, I sent in my farm exemption form, and it took four months to get it back. You leave a message, nobody ever calls back until you get upset and then somebody eventually gets a hold of you, and from that on, it only took three or four days, but it took four months to get a farm back. Well, meanwhile, I'm, uh, I'm redoing the farm. It's costing me money, and it's costing me sales tax that I shouldn't be paying, things like that. And the second thing is that um, 
if there is a list that it can be generated, w for instance, people like me that are wanted to uh, restart a farm, who, in other words, if there's a phone number for this, phone number for that, phone number for that, uh, on the state level or on the federal level, I, I didn't have a problem with the federal level on the USDA up, uh, uh, side of it, but in Connecticut, believe me, I, I, it was like pulling teeth. Wow, thank you for sharing that story. I'm sure that there, there might be some people chomping at the bit to answer that question because I know that we're gonna go down this path and we don't have to stick to the agenda by any means. You know, this is about going where the people wanna go in the, in the discussion. So, Joan? <laughs> I know what you're thinking, is I just don't want to be the person to say it. So when people move to Connecticut, whether they've been farming in another part of the con country, another part of the world, um, Connecticut is a unique animal. And the reason that Connecticut is a unique animal is by the nature of our state constitution, we're a home rule state. The other thing, so a lot of what happens, happens locally, which is why we're here today. The other thing that happens with agriculture um, is farming, especially in Connecticut, touches a lot of different places. It touches consumer protection, the Department of Labor. If, depending on what type of farming you're doing, you may need some sort of certification or licensing that may or may not fall under public health, consumer protection, Department of Agriculture. Um, this is, I'm gonna just, I have to say it, this is a plug for Connecticut Farm Bureau. We are a member servicing organization. Anybody that joins Farm Bureau gets my undivided attention. I understand what it's like to run a production business. I know time is money. So when farmers call me up, they say, I can't get a hold of anybody at Department of Revenue Services. Who do I call? I had a farmer on Friday call me four months. He hasn't gotten his farmer's tax exemption permit. I gave him the direct number. In two hours, he was getting his permit processed. Okay, so while the state agencies do great jobs and they all have a role, it can be very confusing. It can be hard to get um, a, a, a response to a phone call. COVID has made that that much more challenging because a lot of um, personnel are not in their offices. They're working remote. That's what we do. <laughs> I have to talk about a project that Joan was involved in with about five other agencies and they actually put together what is called a farmer's bucket list. And it has all of the kinds of things that you wanna think about. And she has handed that out when we have Farm Bureau meetings. It answers a lot of the kinds of questions, who do you call? It has the suggestions about where to go. And it's literally, it's called a bucket list. And that is a document that six different agencies, including Connecticut Farm Bureau, created. And that has been a really good tool. Um, I actually did a presentation for a local FFA chapter, an alumni chapter, and they were talking about parents that w had children and they wanted to start some farming activities it was one of the tools that they had to answer many of the questions that you just raised. Vince, is, is that good? Do you make some new friends? Yeah, no, that's, that's good. That's You're good with them? Yeah. Larry, what about you? You want to talk about mushrooms? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have a small mushroom farm, and uh, we haven't really encountered a lot of the problems that these major farmers have to, to deal with. You know, we got a commercial piece of property, and really the mushrooms don't make us as much money as educating the people on how to grow them themselves or selling the products to them. So I'm imagining I'm gonna run into some of these problems coming down the line as far as quality and health, health department and all of that. But so far I haven't run into that kind of a problem myself. But it's been very interesting. I've seen how the towns regulate what the farms can do. I live in Morris and there's a farm there now that they're trying to, 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 to People around it are trying to shut it down because they're having concerts on the property. Larry, put put the microphone closer so people can hear you a little better who are zooming in. You know, so I was just, you know, I could see how the town, the town rules and, and their, their zoning can, can restrict the farm to not making as much money as its potential. And especially in these times where you you need other avenues of income because, you know, it's it's so tough to make any money nowadays on the farming end of it. 
but uh, I think that's about it. Thanks. Well, I think that's what it is. I mean, he said also about educating the consumers. This is not, our world is of cows and corn have changed a little bit. So now we have to do, we have to be innovative a little bit. Am I right, the old Yankee ingenuity on farms? Absolutely. Which is one of our things that we wanted to just do the educational thing, which is what he was just talking about. Matter of fact, we, were, we did the inoculation of mushrooms and that's, that's where we want to be able to teach classes on something like that, bringing the consumers in and educate the consumers on health, education, on, on growing. What else we have, Amy? So Amy has actually provided contact information for um, farmers.gov, which we also have pasted over there. Okay, excellent. Just let us know, Jillian, if anyone raises their hand or if they have feedback. Thank you. Okay, so what brought us here today um, to our second forum was that Harvey did want to start teaching classes at the farm. And the classes were going to be on mushroom inoculations. Larry was part of that whole story. Um, and was going to cover his area of expertise, as well as we have a, a log expert, who they call stick experts. Um, and we also had somebody who was able to grow mushrooms from a lab and from um, getting uh, mycelium growing on cardboard from urban areas inside cities, so we're from New York City. And we weren't able to do this. We are like, my gosh, this would be so much fun. Let's invite people to the farm. Let's make it a whole series of classes. Let's structure that. And when we went to do it, and start that planning, we found out, geez, you know, you can't do that in Litchfield because we can't. The regulations don't support that. And when we were turned down after going through the application um, to have that put through, um, we ended up reaching out to Joan. And Joan said, one of the things you can do is hold a farmer's forum. And when we heard about that, we thought, okay, that means it's not just about what we want, but now she said, find out what everyone else wants. What does the town really want, which is why we got a lot of research which is why we're reaching out to so many different people and different resources. So I know, Joan, I keep pointing back to you, um, and we, you just talked a little bit about you know, as, be able to find assistance for farmers um, as they're navigating their way, but what are some of the other basics that you may have said during the first forum that some people who are Zooming in who have not heard uh, before about what brought us here today? Sure, so in our experience in um, years, So what's that? Do you want me to take the mask off or just speak clearer? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so in our experience at Connecticut Farm Bureau, and I work with farmers across the state of Connecticut in numerous municipalities, what happens with agriculture and why we're here today is that no matter what you do on your farms, there are certain aspects that are going to be susceptible to local zoning regulations. And most zoning regulations are written in such a way that if it's not explicitly permitted, it's assumed to be prohibited. And the example that I use is most zoning regulations are not going to address crop production. Zoning regulations are not going to tell you how to grow your crops, regulate your crops. However, where zoning regulations come into play is those added activities that farms want to engage in, such as on-farm retail. Farm wants to put a farm stand in, a farm store. Anything that brings the general public onto the farm starts to create an additional level of activity on the farm that may or may not impact neighbors. And the real challenge is with agriculture and farming are two things. One is that farming is not a one size fits all. Harvey's farm is gonna be different than Karen's farm is gonna be different than uh, other farmers here in the room. Every farm looks different. The configuration of the land, the type of operation. The second and most critical challenge is that farms more often than not are in the residential zone. So you want to do activities on the farm, but you're in a residential zone. We don't move the farm to the commercial or industrial zone where some of this additional activity could take place. It's in the residential zone. That's the challenge 
for agriculture and local zoning. So how do we move this forward? Because I'd like, at the end of today, after today's second forum, to give you some action steps. So the first thing you need to do is look at your plan of conservation and development. Is your town supportive of agriculture? And I'm really excited, Ben, I'm going to put you on the spot as sustainable CT, right? Because this is going to tie into what you're trying to accomplish. What's in your plan of conservation and development? Does it want to support agriculture? And what are action items in your POCD and the goals and objectives? Secondly, you need to look at your local zoning regulations. What's allowed? If it's not explicitly permitted, it's most likely not allowed, which is what brought us here today on Harvey's farm. Then the most important thing is for municipalities to get the input of the farming community, which is why we're here today. What do the farmers want? What do they want to do on their farms now? And maybe what they want to do five years from now, maybe 10 years from now, as the farm grows and develops. Look at that, get input from the farmers, then decide what you need in regulations that's going to allow you that to happen. The regulations should be reasonable. They should be somewhat flexible. The permitting process should be affordable, somewhat expeditious, because again, when you're working a farm, time is money. How that all comes together is what we're here today. And the best way to do that is to have some sort of a conduit between the farmers, planning and zoning, town hall, more often than not, an ag commission or an ad hoc committee can work on the regulations that then can be presented and working with P&Z so it's a productive use of everybody's time. I have five towns right now that I have worked with in the past month where P&Z wrote the regulations thinking what they, they wrote regulations, thinking they knew what the farmers wanted, never spoke to the farmers. Thursday night, one town went to public hearing and P&Z ended up withdrawing those regulations. They're going back to the drawing board. That's an unproductive use of everybody's time. So those are some steps. And there's great guidance. There's the planning for ag guide, which is a product of American Farmland Trust and Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. Third version just came out, hard copy and PDF. I did bring some of the second version with me. But for the best people to get that is, the, is for the, the people, and that, we call them farmers, but we want to say stewards and land stewards is where we're going to bring you in on this, is anybody involved in land and how we can do it really want to take that to their planners. Absolutely and your planning and zoning commission and your municipal leaders and any of the farmers in your community that are gonna be involved in helping you through this process and wanna put the time into it. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, whoa, 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 sorry. Okay, uh, so let's just go back just for a brief sec. Um, if we're talking about what brought us here today, you know, it's kind of tying everything together. One other component that I wanted to add is that we talked to Denise Rapp. Hi, Denise. And uh, we were telling her, you know, this is what we're doing. We're forming uh, like a farmer's forum. We wanted to make sure everybody kind of knew what was going the best we could. And she said, uh, she said, what? Farmer's forum? And her ears perked up because she said that was one of the hit list items. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about that um, and how, how that's helping the process for sustainable Litchfield. And this is a critical component with something new in our town that, that, that hasn't even existed before with sustainable. Sure, so we're um, moving Litchfield towards uh, bronze certification with the state of Connecticut uh, for sustainable Litchfield. And that's part of a broader program that's sustainable Connecticut. So this is a program that is, uh, as, it, as the name says, is moving um, all parts, not just farmers, but all parts of town and all different um, segments of the community towards more sustainable practices. So one of the things that has come up is that the uh, regulations need to be 
more, not just more farmer friendly, but more, you know, solar friendly. More, there's lots of ways that things, to, you know, in town could be more friendly towards uh, moving us to a future that uh, we all and our kids all get to live in. Um, so that, um, you know, that's the, the farmer's forum specifically is one of the actions that we are uh, participating in, that we're all participating in right now, that is going to help us move towards certification with the state as a sustainable town. Thank you. Thank you very much. It really helps tie things together. And one more area we can tie together is, are you Sephra? Hi, Sephra. Would you go over with your microphone to Sephra, please? So we've got one more link here that kind of pulls everything together with pollination. This is Sephra Alexander. Um, yep. <laughs> and um, if you just want to explain a little bit about who you are and your role here today and, and how what sort of trends you've seen with agriculture. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sephra Alexandra, and I lead the Ecotype Project for the Connecticut chapter of the Northeast Organic Farming Association. And we've been working under a USDA specialty crop block grant um, where we wild collect native pollinator seeds and amplify them or grow them out on organic farms in an effort to make that seed available to local nursery men and women so that landscapers and municipalities and homeowners can have access to the right genetic material to be putting the right plants in the right place in an effort to reduce fragmentation and proliferate these pollinator habitats both on farm and in homeowner landscapes. So um, I was excited to hear that Litchfield is encouraged about increasing these efforts here. And so any questions I can help answer about ecotypes or eco-regional seed work, um, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming here. And of course, we're going to put you together with John, and we're going to be talking a lot more about that soon. <clears throat> and I just want to just bring up, when John said that he was wondering why he's here on this, this also brings us down to, you can see that <clears throat> back in the days, you know, I talked to Denise, like it's legal, what's legal in our town is I can open up a bag of, of chemicals and I can put them down in a field right next to my pond and it can go down the stream, that's legal. But about teaching people about pollinators and bees on my class, on my barn, might not be legal. So we, these are the things, the clarification that, that we need to be able to figure out. And when it comes to land trust, how we can use that land, how we can make it more sustainable, that we're all in on this together. And it's not just about the old barns that are falling in that no longer support the cows or no longer support the corn. It's about new innovative ways of how we can use all of our land, even our backyards, for growing and being more sustainable. Am I right? You are right. So um, before we move into a little bit of some of the research that we found, does anybody have any feedback or questions right now, either through Zoom? If you have a question through Zoom, please um, Zoom it in through chat. And um, Jillian will let me know if something comes through. OK, just interrupt if something comes. Or any raise hands? No. Nope. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, what I have up on the screen here is just a snapshot of, uh, we had about 30 responses in our survey when I grabbed this, but you know, if you add up, um, you know, do you believe that farms generate a positive economic impact as well as enhance visual and cultural appeal of our community? It's pretty clear that the vast majority either agree or strongly disagree with that statement. So farms are economically, you know, really important to the baseline of the future of Litchfield. Um, and the whole economic perspective of it ties in with the beautiful cultural um, aesthetic that it brings. I mean, you drive through town and you get a sense of where you are. It feels like Litchfield. I mean, I think Summit, New Jersey may used to, you know, which used to be really farming community probably was like us not that long ago, and they've changed a lot. They don't have very many farmers. They don't, they don't have as much food security right there, um, as with a lot of other towns in Connecticut and in the surrounding areas. So that's something just to think about. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your feedback on the uh, surveys. We've also got a visual here that talks about if regulations were to, re if regulation changes were to occur, what topics would you like to see considered? And it's pretty clear that, that surfacing, that the 
the umbrella of the term agritourism can be very helpful to accomplish that, but we still need to hear from more people if we can. Um, we have a lot of interest in educational classes, holding on-farm events, direct to consumer sales. Um, there's an interest in horse boarding and horse shows, glamping, you know, maybe the Air Airbnb, but camping types, which is something I've been seeing as a growth of farm stays. The farm stay has been something that's, um, are you seeing and hearing a lot more about farm stays? with the Farm Bureau. Safra, have you seen or heard more people talking about farm stays as part of agritourism? Okay, hang on, she, she was just gonna chime in on that. Um, it's one way for, for farms to be more diverse, right? Yep, absolutely, um, for educational and also all the farm to table stuff that happens and um, how you can be more remote stays. My, my friend's actually coming up with a, an app that now will list all the farms that offer that as an option in an effort to help promote that type of agritourism as well. So certainly that is a great industry that's being developed. Have you seen the difference between a farm stay as being more of an activity on the farm as opposed to just staying there like a tent RR? Um, I haven't quite experienced that in person yet, but I know there's a lot of places that um, are farming on their land that are um, implementing those types of yurts or other types of dwellings and um, non-permanent structures to help mm -hmm. facilitate those types of things, but I haven't experienced them. First okay, hand. and unless I'm mistaken, it's something that is not allowed unless it's permitted under a special way here in Litchfield. And part of agritourism, if there's something written into the regulations about that, would you know would have some parameters around it. Doesn't mean you want to have a tent every 25 feet, but you know within reason, I think farmers should be able to consider: is that something that they want to do in Litchfield, and can the town help support that in the regulations? Um, okay. So, if regulation changes were to occur, what topics would you like to see considered? This is the visual on that. Um, you can pretty much tell by this word chart that it's, it has a lot to do with um, holding um, on-farm events, including educational classes and direct-to-consumer sales. And then we talked a lot about that resource guide that you were, you were dipping into. Before we go into that with our POCD and the guidance from this planning for agri agriculture, are there questions? Does anybody want a little splash of water on them? Or everybody like awake still? Are we good? Okay. And what about our Zoomers? Did we get any responses, Kelly or Jillian? All right, guys, raise your hands if you have any questions. All right. So um, uh, POCD or POCAD, uh, P-O-C-A-D, um, is the plan of conservation and development that really becomes a 10-year guide for the town. And um, this is written directly from that booklet that Joan was talking about. It's a tremendous resource that we, we do have copies of, like you said, but every planning and zoning officer needs to have one of these guides because it is extremely thorough. It goes over the POCD, the role of regulations, um, extremely helpful. And while many POCDs refer to agriculture, often citing contributions of local farms and rural character, scenery and historical significance, not all plans capture the full range of benefits to farms, as well as businesses and stewards of large land base bringing to a community, that they bring to a community. So they continue to go on and they have a purpose statement. I'm not gonna read the whole thing and I'll leave it up for a minute. Um, there needs to be flexibility within the POCAD that will accommodate with growth and change of a farm business so that they can actually help encourage the new generation of farmers. This whole next gen of farming is critical. I mean, gosh, think about it. How many more generations of farmers are gonna be, be able, you know, are there kids, like if we could raise hands for Litchfield of people who own farms, do you know anybody who owns a farm and their next generation of offspring are gonna be taking it over? Anybody? Do you know of a farm that you can even think of? You do. You are very fortunate because I know a lot of farmers who say, I don't know what's gonna happen to the farm. And we've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I know at Averill Farms, they're hitting, uh, I hope they got Averills here because I know they were gonna join us. 275th year, they're celebrating 
of, of having this farm in their family, and it is being passed down. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing, but the challenges that they're facing, I'm sure, are very real. You know, I mean, agritourism is probably going to be part of it, or the ability to be able to have certain types of events um, that will help the next gen. I see Sephra's nodding. Yes, yes. Any feedback on that, guys? Anybody chatting in on this? Okay. All right, thank you. So let's take a quick peek. Um, they, there's a case study that's in um, the PDF that you guys can get for the, for the brand new um, planning for agriculture guide. And Lebanon um, has been identified as being one of the uh, one of the best towns who are doing it right, and they're saying town officials are aware that without ongoing planning and public support, agriculture in Lebanon would become a thing of the past. Unless we're really paying attention to this, that can happen here. I mean, I hope people are, are urged to understand that this is a critical time period, and if farmers feel forced to sell their property and break it up, when's the last time you saw a farm turned into housing development, and then converted back to the farm. Anybody raise your hand if you've ever seen that. Never. Never, right? I mean, once it's done, it's done. There's one farm in Watertown I know of, or James, a Crystal Spring farm. They've turned it into, they're actually actively farming the land, which has been in conservation. Thank goodness they're actively farming it, because, I mean, look what's happening to Gustafson's apple farm. You know, nobody, there was not a generation to take over. We actually, farms. we actually just signed a lease for use of two thirds oh, of okay. the property for the next three years. Oh my gosh, that is great news. Thank you, Karen. Kudos, that's great. My nephew worked very hard on that. I bet he did, I bet he did. I mean, you guys, Weeks Farm in um, Morris, you guys drive by that apple farm? Have you looked at their trees? It's not being farmed. Even though agriculture might go into a land trust situation, Having it actively farmed is really critical, and there's something called FarmLink, which is a place which is like, um, uh, like Match.com. It's like people looking for farmland, farmland looking for people, right? Um, do you have anything to share at all about the whole trust, it, you know, farmland trust or uh, the Litchfield land trust trying to get active properties in farming? Or our stewardship chair has had a couple, a few conversations with some interested Good. parties but it, it didn't go anywhere we do have some beautiful prime agricultural land in our holdings you know yeah. we have 3700 acres here in litchfield i know you're willing uh, to entertain the discussion around having them farmed because i did speak with somebody else in your um with that land trust and they said oh yes you know it would be something worthwhile looking at so if you're looking for farmland talk to this guy Jill, you have something to say? okay i think we have a question hello ben poletsky Okay, can I see it? Okay. Um, is there a training opportunity or collateral for volunteer P&Z commission members to become educated on implementing agritourism regulations? Great question. So is there a, an opportunity for collateral or for volunteer P&Z commission members to become educated? There is. We have some documents that you had forwarded to me, um, Joan had forwarded to me about um, agricultural commissions, right? And then guides to help with P&Z. Do you want to talk about that at all? I know you sent me quite a few documents, and we I have some over here. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I think I'd like to just respond to Ben, and I think what Ben's probably looking, uh, and, and Ben chime in on this via the chat, I think what Ben's really referring to is if there's some, at the municipal level, some sort of training that's available to planning and zoning commissions to help them develop regulations related to agriculture. And there are opportunities, there is a, um, I think there's a Connecticut chapter of the Planning Association. Joslyn would actually be an excellent resource for, uh, she would be the one that would be, would be able to help with maybe implementing some sort of initiative through the Connecticut chapter of planners to create a workshop specifically related to ag regulations. I've been asked over the years to do presentations. Last year I did a presentation for about 60 zoning enforcement officers. It's the uh, Connecticut Association of Zoning Enforcement Officers. 
and they asked me to come and be a keynote speaker, but Jocelyn might be a good uh, resource to have that happen for the Litchfield County area. Okay, excellent. Ben, I hope that helps answer your question, and I believe that, um, you know, Jocelyn, if you have something to say. Um, okay, great, perfect. We'd be happy to hold another forum on this topic for uh, local PNZ members. So that was a great question, and let's make that happen. I don't know what that will take, Jocelyn, but. Um, um, Denise wants to know, um, there, okay, there used to be the fifth Thursday of the month workshop, and I'm not sure if that's still happening. Does anybody know fifth about that? Where? Fifth Is that Thursday. something through Jocelyn? Yeah. Um, ben, thanks you. Okay, we still, yes, we still have the fifth Thursdays. Oh, that's a good suggestion, Denise. So do you know, do, who knows about that fifth Thursday? What I'd like to do, uh, Jocelyn, is I'd like to get information from you about that and post that on the Facebook page. So if this is something that others can, can attend, well, we'd like to be able to encourage that. Okay. And we can make it a topic for, this, for, the, for the next forum. So it happens every fifth Thursday, it looks like, and this P and Z regulations for farms can be a topic. Now, is that regional or is that... What, is, what does that mean, that, that meeting? Is that regional? Is that yes, yep. So North that's the Northwest Hills Northwest? Council oh. of Governments. Okay, good. Yes, yep. Excellent. Yes, it's regional. Okay, I need to get to my slide. Okay, so here's the um, Town of Litchfield's uh, guiding vision statement. And I uh, just wanted to make it available so you guys can see it. Um, Litchfield is a rural community with a rich agrarian and industrial history. The town is the home to unique villages that are comprised of historic structures anchoring Litchfield to its past. Open space is highly valued, and Litchfield actively protects its most sensitive ecological and scenic areas. Litchfield's stewardship, Litchfield's stewardship of its open space and historical architecture to its e economic base is by attracting tourism to the town. Litchfield is the home of lifelong families, new arrivals, and is welcoming visitors. I've underlined here the town values its local farms and businesses in many ways. And it talks about goods, essential goods and services and employment opportunities and um, families and how they grow. And their last sentence here is, Litchfield is a community that is open to growth and change that is consistent with the town's identity and respectful of the town's unique and natural cultural resources. Who thinks a farm is a natural and cultural resource here? Raise your hand. Every hand is going up. I mean, it is. So, well, maybe not every. Um, does, do you guys have any feedback on the, uh, this vision statement from the POCAD for Litchfield? And what does that translate to? To me, it looks like opportunity right, to kind of play this, to have this um, chime in. In fact, um, we've got David Wilson here. Did you have anything you wanted to share about farming and the POCAD? Can you, can you go over with your microphone? Thank you. I learned about the forum uh, just a short time ago and um, I did dial into the YouTube and uh, listen to the first session. And uh, certainly I know Joan and Karen and Bill Davenport. Um, so I think that you're, you're on the right track. As I sat here and I listened to the gentleman from uh, Morris, uh, it came to me that should this be bigger than just Litchfield because we're here in Northwest Connecticut. Um, the towns I represent are uh, Warren, Litchfield, Morris, Bethlehem, and Woodbury and we have farms all up and down that district, and you all have probably very common um, concerns. Um, I currently sit on the Environment Committee, which is certainly tied to certain aspects uh, of farming. I'm also on the Appropriations Committee, which certainly is an important one to farming, um, and I have a really uh, strong interest uh, as a member of the Rural Caucus in Hartford, and 
especially for the education of our children. Uh, uh, Bill certainly knows that, that I try to do the best I can to uh, make the, the funding of the ag science programs at our regional uh, schools in Woodbury and Litchfield uh, one of my top priorities. So um, I, I want to just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. I'm here kind of listening and learning today. Um, I don't think that I really had any surprises. I think because of um, my uh, involvement with the farming community and FFA and so forth, over the last several years, I've already learned a lot of these things that you're talking about. Uh, as far as the poke had here in Litchfield, um, I served as the treasurer of the town of Litchfield for 30 years. I've lived here all my life. I could spit to my house from here. Uh, I grew up uh, working on a farm across the street here. Um, and, and I have very strong ties uh, in the area. So. I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I think that the, the zoning issue is uh, probably the biggest one, the biggest hurdle uh, that you're gonna run into because a lot, a lot of times, I think it's already been mentioned, um, it's not in my backyard. Um, you know, when my good friend Ben Poletsky and Morris uh, tried to work on the survival of his business, the community down there, uh, uh, outspoken voices, I'll say, in the community, uh, opposed what he was trying to do, uh, which really, in my opinion, was just economically survive through the pandemic so that he can get back to doing uh, what he likes to do. Um, and I think trying to work together uh, to make these kind of things happen, you have to have an open mind, especially in a time uh, that we're in right now with, with COVID. So um, I, I encourage you, my, my door is open, my phone is open, my emails are open. Uh, I think that most people will tell you that I'm quite responsive. The gentleman that was having the issues, um, I think I may have steered you to Joan uh, had you called me, had you reached out to me. So if you're having issues as a small business owner trying to get started and you're running up against the bureaucracy in Hartford, uh, and you're from my district, I'll advocate for you as hard as I possibly can. So, uh, and I know that Senator Minor feels the same way uh, for all of the towns that he represents. So uh, as far as the voice from Hartford, I, I think that you, you certainly here have our ear. Um, it may not be the same in other districts around the state. So thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Are you familiar, David, that I think uh, Woodbury is uh, considering changing their zoning regs to allow more activities on farms to, so that they can diversify? Okay, good, we're gonna try to stay in touch with them. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. Um, this is some identifications of uh, where agricultural impact is identified in the POCAD. Um, agri agricultural tourism, program is center, centered on the town's historic, rural, recreational, and agricultural assets to promote as agritourism destinations. So the whole idea of me reading that is that they're looking to exploring, explore developing heritage and agricultural tourism programs centered on the town's historic, rural, recreation, and agricultural assets, agricultural assets to promote this as a tourism destination. The other um, excerpt that I pulled was, um, in addition, it says, uh, there is some potential for conversation of existing large, of conversion of existing large farms into rural residential developments, potentially to the detriment of Litchfield's agrarian landscape. As economic pressures on existing farms have grown, making agriculture difficult to, to sustain some local farmers can be expected to seek approval for broader uses of agricultural lands, such as event spaces for or for agritourism. It's all written right into the POCAD. I don't think that this is any surprise. We knew that during the planning and zoning he hearing when we were shot down and denied just because of regulations. So the good news is, is that they are looking into doing that, but the bad thing that we wouldn't want to have happen would be have anything written behind closed doors, right, Joan? Um, when there's not an opportunity for farmers' voices. Anybody want to chime in on that? Thoughts? Anybody online? Sephra. <laughs> Here comes Sephra from CT NOFA. 
um, ecotype? Oh, from, so from CT Nova, for the ecotype project, but from my, my own personal journey with um, how I came to be involved in this work, I received my teaching masters in, in Cornell in agroecological education. Um, how can we teach the next generation of farmers? And as much as I learned in the classroom, where I always learned was on all the farms. And every farm that I've been a part of in this country, around the world, has an educational facet to it, whether te they're teaching regenerative design principles, whether it's permaculture or seed saving, or you're teaching kids. The, that place-based education is what made, makes you actually understand. You can tell someone and they'll forget. You can show someone they'll remember, but involve them, and then they want to do it as a lifelong hobby. And certainly in the case of the pandemic now, um, certainly local food security has never been more important, and making sure that we're resilient as a community means having as many people involved in the caretaking and stewardship of our land, not only for the pollinators, but for which ultimately is how we have local food, but also making sure that the next generation um, has those hands in the soil experiences. And so, especially now that so many people are homeschooled, I also um, have teaching certifications with wilderness skills schools and all sorts of outdoor education and nothing is more important for raising uh, the next the next cohort of, of stewards so I think um, everything that comes off of those farms when people are involved and they understand how to ferment how they how to make farm to table dinners if kids understand how to plant and grow seeds when you have education you have those access ability um, it makes your town look like such a great resource and that you're all resilient together but that education is so much more fruitful so certainly was for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I, you, I love Sephra. the word that you said, Stuart, again. And um, <clears throat> have you met John before today? No. Just on the phone. On the email. On the email. So, we have, so we have educators that, and you're a retired educator, but, but you're not giving up the ghost yet, right? <laughs> right? So it doesn't make sense to us. And, and you know, one of the things I had on my Facebook site was, who says we should teach, who, who says we could teach on the farm? I mean, how many people support us on it? Well, we had like, 323 people that said things like, you should be able to teach anywhere you want. This is still America. Now, why wouldn't we teach on a farm to be able to do hands-on when each farm does different things? We're going to learn mushrooms there, and then we're going to learn about immunity building of mushrooms, healthy grown beef, of how we can not put antibiotics into our beef, perhaps. Stephen, I'm sure you could have a whole bunch of things that you would Talk to us about regenerative agriculture and things that you could, you could teach on the farm. Stephen, is, uh, who works at Chinnacler Acres, is actually doing a victory garden class here at Wisdom House. you want to just talk about that a little bit? Am I putting you on the spot, Stephen? Actually, before Stephen answers that question, you can still proceed to give him the, to give him the microphone. Um, the question that Sefer was really adapt, was asking, and this was um, through Zoom, uh, what she was answering about like the next gen of what's gonna happen and how um, if we take a look at that excerpt from how the POCAD identifies agricultural impact, that we have an opportunity to do that and just what it can look like in a successful form. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely have to agree with you, Sephra. I, I went to um, uh, UConn Agricultural School and what I noticed, even though I was part of the organic gardening club there, I didn't have a single class leave the classroom until I went to Italy for three months. And then when I was doing an ag program in Italy, we were on farms constantly. And I learned 10 times as much, you know, being out there in these different regions of Italy that were specializing in different types of food, different types of agriculture. Um, so I, I, I couldn't agree strong, strongly enough. Uh, so I guess you were asking me about the program that we're running here at Wisdom House, I think it's April 24th, 27th. Um, Lisa could correct me. Uh, essentially, we're, we're trying to do a short uh, Saturday session where we, uh, we bring in as many people as possible uh, to just learn about how to be successful in growing food. Uh, you know, that's kind of how I'm interpreting Victory Garden. It's, you know, if you have a porch you can grow food on, you know, let's grow food there. If you have a small plot in your backyard, let's grow some food there. Let's just make it something that doesn't become a, a project that, you know, you start and then leave halfway. Let's make it something that becomes part of your lifestyle and part of a, you know, a habit. Um, 
And, and so that's really what we're going to be doing here. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's not something we're doing at Chanticleer right now, but we're lucky to have these partners here at Wisdom House. Thank you. Amy, I just want to ask Ben a question. Amy, I just want to ask Ben a question. Now, all of what you're hearing yeah. is this is a sustainable community is what you make when you can, you can raise stewards and they don't have to be farmers with 100 acres, 10 acres. They could have a backyard, they could have a porch. They could be in their backyard. I mean, is this a sustainable community? Is this something that we could all agree on? Sure. I mean, are you suggesting that there's uh, possibilities, you know, when a lot of people would think of a farm as being a very large acreage. So, uh, so a sustainable uh, future may include uh, very small farms. It sounds like that's what you're talking about. Uh, certainly, yeah. And, that, uh, and how that could uh, also help the town with its food sources. And if we're, you know, with food security seems to keep coming up. Um, so the regulations, and then Amy keeps talking about the regulations in town, um, that would have to reflect that because now you're not talking about farms being these large, you know, you know, hundred, couple hundred acre uh, places. They certainly can be, but what are you going to do with it? What kind of regulations are going to um, govern a two acre farm? You know, uh, and so I see also a disconnect between what occurs to me as we're listening is that there's a disconnect between the POCD and the planning and zoning department, right? So the POCD says, let's move in this direction and let's do these things. And then you try to do them. And then you, you run into a, a problem with the regulations, uh, you know, the way planning and zoning sees things. So there's, you know, there's a lot to move forward on there. I, I see that. Um, as far as the uh, sustainable Litchfield goes, you know, I, I don't see the connection right now, but I, I have taken in a lot already. There's a lot to learn here. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to hear all these different viewpoints. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate all that. Everything's kind of tying together. Karen, do you have a question? Just kind of picking up on what he said. Um, Joan, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a University of Connecticut um, study and it talked about uh, the where the largest growth of farms was and 22 percent were five acres or less of new farms. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. And that's people that are that are <coughs> creating honey, creating jams, they have berry bushes, they have garlic. Garlic. Garlic is big. There's a garlic festival in, in uh, uh, where's Beth Bethlehem, Bethlehem is the big garlic festival around here. Oh, yeah, the so microgreens. Micro there's a greens. lot of different things that are happening on those very small and, farms. And so that's my question: is when we want to be successful, we want to think ten. We want to think ten years ahead. And what the the podcast has done is is it guides us there. Mm -hmm. And we we need the planning and zoning and the other leaders of our planners of our of our towns. And as Joan and I have talked about, there's 169 towns in the great state of Connecticut. So they can all come to different conclusions on things. But we have to think 10, will there still be big farms? Will people still be doing it? Or will, the, will we get our food source in a different way? You know, but, you know one of the things that I, that I read was in the Second World War, 40% of, you know, in our victory gardens, 40% of our food was grown in the backyards. So hmm. there's, you know, ways to tie sustainability in is just back to the history of it. Mm -hmm. And the fact is we have fertile soil and if people know not to put chemicals on their lawns, kill the bees, which isn't helping out any pollinators when you're putting these chemicals on there. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to all get together and plan on that, is that sustainable? Sure it is. And one of the goals certainly of Sustainable Connecticut <clears throat> is getting that kind of word out there, getting this, you know, this sort of public education that you're you know, uh, helping us organize here. Well, you're back to educators, and we have two great educators, mm -hmm. that, you know, many educators in this room that want to get, literally get their hands in the dirt, <laughs> their hands in the soil, and understand what makes good soil, what makes the good microbes, which actually helps the nutrition, which actually helps the family. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, I think too often in education, that's really the only thing I can really speak of. And Bill, you and I have had this conversation while running so often. It's, it seems like there's a schism. And it's, it was sad to hear Stephen's account. I studied organic farming, but it wasn't until I did that program in Italy. Uh, it, it, there's schism is that there's scholarly kids, and then there's the hands-on kids. And that has always been a problem with me. I've always, I've always hated that. Um, and I, I, I'm the guy at Litchfield High School who had probably more field trip forms. And, and it, it was the, the, the extended block schedule that really was my saving grace where I could take kids out even on our campus to do whatever. But I don't, I'm not here to blow, toot my horn. We're here about talking about future things. It's very positive if you are in Litchfield, Goshen or Morris, support that uh, combination of our school districts. I'm just gonna say that for programming. <laughs> and it's not just a compartmentalized VOAG program. It can be more integrated for the future of our kids to, to have those experiences. I mean, VOAG bill is not just a kids that, it's, it's an elective option, no, for certain kids if they wanna take a specific course, right? And conversely, the kids who are, you know, who are more agriculture um, inclined are gonna take other classes as well. It, it's, that's, that's it, to answer that uh, question about the future and how the educational's role in that, I, I see a lot of promise as well as cost savings for our four communities, if we can move that in that direction, you know, move in, in that collaborative uh, direction. I think in the, uh, if the cost saving alone is in health and nutrition as well. Absolutely. Sorry. I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean to keep taking them out, but just um, one thing on that word sustainable, right? So if we think about sustainability and we think about our current state of our land use, we can't sustain the land use that we have because it's so fragmented and it doesn't support our pollinators or have these corridors. If you wanna be sustainable, you have to be having regenerative practices being going on on your landscape. And to do that, nothing is more important than these small scale farms. Because if you look at the ranges that these pollinators travel in, it's really like sometimes less than a mile or even a couple acres. So unless we have these pollinator habitats frequently throughout these landscapes, throughout Litchfield, then we're not gonna be able to be sustainable because we won't have the pollinators there to make our produce be there or feed the animals or do the whole ecological web that's necessary. And just from the seed production, we just had the Northeast Organic Seed Conference and we're doing a big push to amplify this local native seed. In a row that's maybe three times this, this table with 200 native plants, I plant one seed, the next year I'm literally harvesting millions of seed off of a row like that. So it, and then that seed all goes out into the landscape and really reduces fragmentation and helps us have those wildlife corridors and truly be sustainable. So it doesn't take a lot of room to learn and to really help, again, caretake and steward our environment. So thank you again. And I'm also gonna pick up where Shafra left off. I mean, the idea of the poster child of pollinators is a non-native species. It's the European honey, uh, honeybee. And that is a, was a, a, a relationship that was meant to happen. It was very important, I guess, in these colossal industrialized farms. So if we're talking the a largest a growth sector in small farms, you know, cr you know, carting around these, these boxes of honeybees is not necessarily the sustainable approach. There are almost 400 species of bees, just bees, and I, if you, in Connecticut, so you can take a look at this volume if you're interested in what I just said. And most of them are not, uh, you know, a lot of fanfare. They're they're gr solitary ground nesting. They're the only other social species are the are the bumblebees, which are buzz pollinators. And a lot of our food crops are in fact pollinated by them. So, Sephir, I couldn't agree more. This is uh, I hope I hope. Not only the future of agriculture, but also the you know a, a way a role that maybe we're you know we're going to inadvertently play, but in the role of protecting diversity, because we are also in the midst of a sixth extinction. You know, the last one was when the dinosaurs went kaput. This one is happening just as fast, according to the scientists, but we are playing a bigger role in that. 
So we can also play a role in reversing that trend. And that's really what sustainability is. So that's all I can bring to this forum. <laughs> don't, you love, don't you love John? Can I just go to Stephanie for a minute? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, Stephanie Weaver, I've, I've been a lifelong resident since fourth grade of Litchfield, and I've been an attorney for 32 years, but you guys have been doing a wonderful job with the plugging on the small farms, but I just wanted to do a little plug for the larger farms, because really one of the things that we all appreciate here in Litchfield County is the open space, and open space is often the larger farms that are still struggling and trying to figure out a way to be viable. And one of the things I was thinking about was some of the history of the larger farms, and that was the migrant workers. The migrant workers would come across and help harvest the apples or, or the tobacco or what, what have you that was happening on these larger farms. So we got very used to visitors to farms that actually uh, helped in the process of harvesting. So the, ag the, the POCAD, which talks about tourism, but it also talks about um, the, the resources that farms can give here. I think some of this agriturismo, where you allow people to visit farms and maybe you involve them in the process of harvesting. I mean, wouldn't that be a fun thing to go and, you know, and just participate for a week on a harvest somewhere? But if we can sort of incorporate in our zoning regulations a way to allow people to actually be part of a farm on a visit basis and make them a viable part of our plan of development. Thank you, Stephanie. That couldn't be a better segue to something, a little video I was going to show. I'm not sure if I can, can play it. I, I do have one thing. Uh, so Laurel Galloway had said sustainable, sustainable Litchfield should include teaching another a generation as one of your sustainable checkboxes. Okay. Let's see if I can... Um, well, when I, when I get to it, I'm going to see if I can't play a video, but it talks about agritourism and bringing people here on a tourist basis, like going through Italy and stomping grapes. It becomes an experience, and it's an economic driver for the, for the uh, community. Stephen has a question? Harvey? Stephen? Okay, so Stephen is adding to what we're saying and um, to... Chime in on that. Uh, well, I just wanted to kind of chime in there and, and maybe put uh, my buddy Matt here on the spot because Matt's an educator at the Foreman School and a chef. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I see Litchfield as having these amazing restaurants and really a pretty cool culinary scene. So, you know, that clearly has this, this tourist link. And, you know, I just, I, I don't, I think we could promote that more, the link between our restaurants, our farms, you know, our chefs and, uh, and, you know, Matt's done a really great job there. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Matt. <laughs> Word on that. Um, well, I guess that gets back into education, but generationally, the whole town of Litchfield taking pride in its agriculture and creating a cuisine around that agriculture, um, which I don't really see. I mean, there are some, you know, good restaurants, nice restaurants here. They do do a good job, but I mean, that's white tablecloth uh, restaurants and who can really afford that all the time and you know as a teacher of high school students and and just kind of seeing the what people are normally eating around here it's you know it's it's gas station pizza uh, you know off the back of a Cisco truck that's food that travels 2,000 miles and like where's the pride in in this town and in your culture and where's your cuisine and let's start creating it as a, as a small community and you know I mean being a seed steward and steward and uh, saving seeds and teaching each generation to cultivate the land and then creating a cuisine that can make a beautiful culture continue to uh, grow is, is what this town uh, is, is sitting on. But these rules and regulations and are, are just keeping it at such a stagnant pace. It's kind of frustrating as an outsider who has moved here uh, to, to kind of see this. You know, I was you know, born and raised in New Orleans and uh, you know, went off and trained in New York City, and, and that kind of is really what kind of took it all off, was being able to cook from the farmer's market, and then moving here and seeing this beautiful farmland and the potential here is just, and just, you know, regulation after regulation, stopping these, you know, 
farmers and their entrepreneurship uh, just is, is really kind of frustrating to see. And I hope that you know everybody listening today can and take that and then we can kind of come together and really make a, a big difference here because I have a young daughter here. I plan on staying here. I plan on growing you know, uh, a program at Foreman uh, about food and agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and regenerative cooking along with that. Uh, and I hope we can keep going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, yeah, I just, I mean, <laughs> I just feel like, you know, we have a farmer's market that's hidden behind a school. You can't see it on the road. Our tourists are coming by, and they have no idea what's really going on. There's, like, a sign, but, like, hey, it's over there. Like, we have a long green that's right there. It's just, I just feel like there's a lot more that could, that can continue to be done, and I think this is a first step. You know, people are being able to speak loudly about it, um, and, and be able to, to move forward. So your concern was that there aren't, there aren't restaurant farm to table enough of that going on? Well, I think, I mean, and, and, and if there's not the enough supply, if there's not enough supply, then obviously it's going to, you know, if just economics is <coughs> not enough supply, it's going to be high price. So these restaurants, you know, they're running, they're, you know, the way that they're running, they're not able to go ahead and, and you know, be able to bring everything in from a farm. But, you know, um, it just seems like everybody has the same menu, and when you're having farmland all around you, and you know, it's going to take time to build this cuisine, uh, and you know, I just, I just think that there is uh, more that can be done, and I just think it's going to take more conversation. I think you know, it's a very long answer that I'm going to have to Thank give you. you guys. Thank you. One of the things I appreciate about Matt is he does buy the weirdest things that I have available. If it, the weirder the better for him. So I, I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, just one second, David has a question, but we have some Zoomers that have come in. Um, we've got from Denise, she said, yes, this past summer, the Village Restaurant had partnered with the Northwest Food Hub to purchase local product and promote the CSA, 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 the new, the new tagline. Thank you, Denise. Um, buying locally from farms, this is from Denise Continued, buying locally from farms supports our local economy gets large transportation trucks off the roads and reduces the amount of bulk packaging that is needed to transport the products. The local farm stands and farmers markets promote a sense of community and pride. It is important for farmers and those who support farmers to show up at planning and zoning public hearings to support that change and progressive initiatives. I wholeheartedly agree with that gentleman. Thank you, Denise, thank you, and David Wilson. Thank you. I, I would like to know if you started with a specific bullet list of the zoning regulations that are preventing you from doing farming. That is a good question. First of all, I'm, I'm not an expert, guys. Um, and we can bring people in and we can have Denise chime in. We don't have the planning and zoning people that I'm aware of on the call. Um, but we did form a small subcommittee and we've been a little bit of workhorses working later some nights than others um, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, Meg Finn is here um, today on that. We've got a few other people probably Zooming in who are on that subcommittee. Part of our project and ongoing research, I mean, we all have full-time jobs or are full-time parents and are trying to squeeze all this in. We need support looking through those regulations a little bit more. Um, we do have, uh, uh, Barbara Putnam and Will Neary um, spent quite a bit of time putting together a chart with, that shows which um, zoning regulations are permitted um, or not permitted or, or only by special exception. That's over there on the table. It's a work in progress. We're just pulling all this together. It's really going to take a village to get this done. I mean, we need help. We really need help. Once we identify these things, they have to be written and and somehow figured out a way that it can be presented and reasonable. And if I chime back in with um, Joan, we talked a little bit about like an agricultural commission um, that could maybe serve as a guide on some of this with us. We've got Jocelyn Eyre, who's with the Council of Governments, who can help also, but we really have to get it ready to be able to show. I mean, this is... I mean, it is a swamp that we're wandering through where there's... the I can't even pronounce, I'm dyslexic, the pod... What is a podcast? What is that called? 
and then there's the right to farm. So we have all of these things. You think that we should be able to, it should have, we should have knocked it out of the park, and all we want to do is have a teaching farm and just work on working with pollinators and, and collecting seeds. I mean, you think it should have been knocked out of the park. So to David's point, you know, what's, what's stopping us? What's the stumbling blocks? David would like to know, David Wilson wanted to know what we were turned down on. Well, there, there were multiple reasons, David, but there were, um, there was a uh, allusion to, uh, alluding to expand, expanding a non-conforming use. The, the barns necessarily are right on the road, probably with Chanticleer Acres a little bit more than some farms, but right on the road, and so therefore, the barn itself is a non-conforming use, and if we have it occupied with people learning, that's an expansion of a non-conforming uh, uh, use. There was also a reference that it was a multiple use of the properties, that if you have farming on the property, that you couldn't also have teaching on the property. Um, and so those are just two of the reasons. And then, um, and then what the Connecticut Farm Bureau, uh, Joan, referred to is the, uh, the fact that residential grows in, in farming zones, and then all of a sudden it's the residential people that are, sa that are starting to be alarmed about people coming to the farm and therefore increasing traffic. David, I can assure you that I did not build that barn in, in 1812 that close to the road. And, and Peter Litwin said that he took 4-H classes at, on the farm in the 1950s. So there was education on a farm, and, it's, and we even have a precedent of it. So it's almost like us teaching swimming, and we don't have a pool. You, you follow where I'm going? OK. Um, I have something here um, from Amy Fusco, and she says, uh, so she's with the USDA FSA. She said that if you'd like to join my e-newsletter, you'll be informed about all of the funding farm service agency, of all of the, far, of all of the funding farm service agencies um, and their offerings. We send, it out to, we send it out one to two bulletins per month. And we can email Amy, actually her contact information should be over there on the table, but she's available at amy.fusco at usda.gov. Yeah, that's helpful, Amy. I mean, anything helps move the needle to make it better for these farmers to diversify and become more so solid and more secure. Um, I know there are a lot of loans available. Um, not everybody wants to have to take a loan, but sometimes we need to, to get our businesses started, and farms are businesses. And the POCAD does support farms and businesses. So let's try to get the regulations to work with that. Um, here's an example of the permitted uses. Um, and then proposed permitted uses are also printed out over there on the table. Like I said, it's a work in progress. Um, the subcommittee was working very hard on that. That was Will and Barbara. Thank you so much. But you can take some time to study that. We're only, only at the beginning phases. And then there um, also identifies some areas that should be considered as permitted uses or topics that may have not been covered in the regulations that should be. Okay, and um, that's yet to come still. What I did is I went through um, a, a bunch of towns on top of what Joan had given us and I had a little bit more help doing that, looking at zoning regulations that support just what we're looking for. And um, it includes Woodbury's pending approval, uh, Simsbury, East Windsor, uh, Waterford, Deep River, Killingworth, Granby. And I didn't go to every town. I didn't have a chance to go through 169 towns and look at their <laughs> regulations. I wish I did. We need more help doing that. Um, but you know, there are different ways that, that, that these towns are supporting their farms, and they're doing a good job of it. And maybe they're having some struggles, like you said, with a sleepy agricultural commission um, or a board of advisories, Joan. But let's keep the conversation going on that. Um, any feedback at all from Zoom? Any questions coming in? OK. So um, are there any other topics that you guys felt like you wanted to get to know a little bit or have questions for? Because otherwise, I'd like to play a brief um, Vincent has a question, Harvey. A brief video about agriturismo. 
Yes, I do have. Um, um, is the uh, farming community in Connecticut has any representation the state level at all? Do you, would you know that or not? And I'll give. I'll tell you why the reason I'm asking that question. There's a uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of exemptions as far as personal property is concerned, and that's true for most towns in Connecticut. The if we don't lobby the state to remove an unlimited exemptions, if for instance, if I have a tractor is worth hundred thousand, I'm, I'm buying another tractor is worth another hundred thousand. Now I got to pay taxes on that second tractor. Now it creates another burden on that farming uh, because I have second tractors. So for me to increase the production and buy a second tractor has cost me money. Mm. Good point. I'm not even sure. Thank you, Joan. So I don't, I don't want to get off topic on zoning regulations, but this would be additional conversation. Um, there are statewide mandated exemptions for farming, like Public Act 490, which is your current use assessment for farmland, forest land, and open space. There's a $100,000 exemption on farm equipment. Um, there's uh, property, personal property exemptions for certain crop production. Um, uh, structures that are ex totally exempt from personal property tax. Um, there, however, there are what we call the optional municipal um, exemptions that a town can choose to adopt to further support farms in those communities. The towns can opt to exempt up to $100,000 of uh, 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 real estate taxes on farm buildings, that's a per building exemption, not an aggregate of the building. They can also add an additional $100,000 to the mandated 100 to take the exemption to $200,000. And there's a third abatement that's a little bit more complicated. We refer to it as the 50% abatement on property taxes. Those are municipal um, options, which down the road, your town could explore there are over 36 towns now in Connecticut that have some form of exemption on farm buildings. Uh, almost as many towns have added the additional 100,000 on farm equipment. So I don't want to get talking about taxes because that would take the rest of the afternoon. But, but those are additional initiatives that your town could That's undertake. at the local level. Local. For instance, Bethlehem chose to go to 200,000 on the farm buildings. In Watertown, we had a property owner um, survey all of us that had, um, were in real estate that was being used in farming, and we have a 100,000. And when he wrote a letter to the town um, to ask to go to 200,000, the town needed to know what uh, effect that would have on the taxes for the town, and we kind of got hung up there. So I mean, every town deals with that differently. Yeah, I was thinking more though, do we have any representation as far as the farming farming um, um, community's concerned at the state level, lobbying the state to change rules and regulations of exemptions. For instance, I want to remove all the exemption on personal property if it's used for farming. Is there any representation at all at the state mm -hmm. level? That's what I'm Connecticut thinking. Farm Bureau does that job for us. We're the largest lobbying right. organization for, in the lobby state. For, uh, okay. People who are farming and are not Farm Bureau members are not represented. They are not in the game. They don't know what's being offered this year through the legislators, through the senators, and then they have no tool to give the fed feedback back to those people who have to vote on these proposals. And there are an incredible amount of number of proposals every single year that have an effect on farming. Hmm. So if you're not a Farm Bureau member, you're not going to get an email that they're talking about this. They want to hear how that will affect you. They got an incredible amount of response from people when the whole $15 minimum wage process came in. Am I right? Absolutely. They heard from farmers. They heard from other people as well. But I mean, if you're, if you're farming and you're not a Farm Bureau member, you're not at the table. As easy as that. I'm one of the lobbyists. We've got some heavy hitters here today. <laughs> We're so happy to have you, have you here. 
Um, I wanted to read one thing about um, what's in the POCAD continued. One was that um, regarding economic development policies and strategies uh, for guiding policy, it says to encourage sustainable economic growth and faster new job creation, recommended policy champion would be the Economic Development Commission. Now under that, um, one of the bullet points for, rec for recommended development actions is uh, to explore developing heritage and agricultural tourism programs centered on the town's historic, rural, recreational, and agricultural assets to promote it as a tourism destination. That's one of the other items that's written in the POCAD. And if I can, if there's nobody else who's zoomed in with a question, I'm just going to quickly play this one p bit of a video that came out of TEDx Hudson. It's about agriturismo, and it kind of explains it in a nutshell, um, and then we'll just kind of wrap things up. Okay. Hopefully this will work. Um. Generally speaking, agritourism allows farmers to diversify operations, spread financial risk, and in many cases, maintain family farmland in production. Once up and running, an average farm stay here generates a third of a farm's total revenue. Farmers also considered the non-financial benefits of agritourism integral to the overall viability of their enterprise. Most farmers said that opening their doors kept the farms feeling vibrant and engaged with the community, center of giving and receiving. Although not every farmer is cut out to be a host, those that are find the exchange of inspiration and ideas with guests to be a big perk. Ten years ago, the New York Times called the Hudson Valley the Napa of the East. We already have many artisanally crafted food products, many small farm businesses. Hudson itself, rich in maritime history, urban rural linkages, has lots of press. So what's the new opportunity? Well, whether filled with grapes in Puglia or Napa, or apples here in Columbia County, Every field has a story. These stories are waiting to be harnessed and woven together. Collectively, I think that these simple experiences compose the future of the region's character and identity. The Hudson Valley tourism market already generates $3.15 billion annually, but to date, marketing efforts have been disparate and disorganized. So the idea is, then to build a synchronized, visible identity that links together the food, beverage, farm, and tourism industries. This could take the form of a new brand, perhaps coordinated through a consortium. This distinctive brand would connect product to place. The brand would have the culturally and environmentally sound principles of sustainable food and a, uh, aesthetic to match. Proven European models of terroir, which designate the geographic origin of a particular product, can apply to the diverse topography of the Hudson Valley. I believe this diversity is a strength, and the opportunity we have in front of us is to translate place-based food into a wider discussion of place-making. Of course, agritourism is not a panacea for the food and farm viability issues we do face. However, I argue that agritourism addresses many mutual goals of land conservation, rural economic development, environmental education, even food security, and is therefore is worth a closer look. Farm stays, for example, fill tourist beds and maintain on-farm livelihoods translating our region's best natural assets into regenerative, cultural, and economic ones. While it is unlikely that the US government will subsidize agritourism anytime soon, as is done in Italy and France, what can be encouraged is a conversation about standards, parameters, leadership, and moreover, new types of investment in this new field. Farm stays are like the apple was to Eve. 
an invita overnight invitation to try on our more wild selves. Let's move from staid, out-of-date models of land conservation in which we document and revere nature as something out there to new forms of reverence, grounded in our senses, grounded in personal use and engagement. Let's move the natural world closer into the familiar, into its appropriate place within us rather than just around us. My grandfather used to say, Take me back to the old country. We should look overseas for old world tradition and inspiration. America's food culture remains ill-defined, young, awkward. We have lots to learn. But in part, through agritourism, we can spotlight and protect what is unique to this landscape. We can designate what is distinctive to this place. After all, Every age old tradition was, at one point, an innovation simply worthy of repetition. The emerging Hudson Valley food culture dances at the intersection of tradition and innovation. And lucky for us, this next dance is in a field under the stars. Thank you. <clears throat> Did I just say something? Matt mentioned, Matt mentioned it being the community. That's the Napa Valley of the East is Hudson. I mean, I love that. I mean, an innovation is if, we're, if we are using the word sustainable in, in food, in your yard, in your community, in your restaurants. Is the tie getting closer? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, it occurs to me, one of the things that I was, we were talking about, the, someone was talking about the farmer's market. And it's almost a, a question back out to the farmers. Is it really, is it sustainable that you only can buy direct from the farm from 8 a.m. to noon on Saturdays? I mean, we like to shop every day, right? I mean, we don't get our vegetables once a week. Is that something that needs to, you know, we need to make it more available, I would think, on a regular basis. Agreed, agreed. I hope that you guys found that um, video helpful in explaining agritourism and kind of getting you guys a little bit excited about it. I know we're wrapping up. We just want to talk a little bit about the next steps. Um, so did we understand about an agricultural commission and the benefits of having an advisory council kind of put together that will help? Do, did, you, did we go into that enough, do you think, Joan? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd like to just weigh in i think that's a good place to start with and you could it doesn't even have to be a full-blown commission um your town may agree to maybe just make it an ad hoc committee of another existing commission there are some towns where their ag committee is a subcommittee of economic development which is a re i think a really good fit so you could do that um and then the other thing i just like to just give you three takeaway points on this one is that Litchfield does not have to reinvent the wheel. You're not starting from square one. This is going on all over the state, so you can certainly um, look at regulations that have already been adopted in other towns. That gives you a good place to start. You don't have to start from square one. Secondly, I think it's equally as important to recognize the non-farming community and your neighbors. And so I just got this out of a Planning and Zoning Commission meeting that uh, Thursday night on another town that P and Z withdraw their, withdrew their regulations as a result of pushback from the farmers. And two things came out of that. One is that oftentimes the non-farming community has this fear of the unknown. And they say, oh, if the farm's allowed to do this, you know, we're going to have existing, we're going to have more traffic. It's going to negatively impact our quality of life. And you have to sort of, it's very serious and it's, it's important to recognize those concerns, but you have to lay that to rest. And I think the most important thing that I got out of Thursday night, there was a farmer there, fifth generation, very well established farm in the New Haven area. And he said, I own this land. I live on this property and I live in this community. What makes you think that I would want to do something on my farm in the town that I live in with the people I'm going to see every day 
on a property where my own house is that I would want to do anything to negatively impact my relationship with my community or my neighbors. And so I think that was a great message from a farmer who said, if we're going to do this, I want to do it right. And I would, uh, that helps your non-farming community, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So if we, there's a lot to take on. And I think uh, one of the areas that we discussed is, do we do one more farmer, one more farmer's forum? at which time we review some of the regulations that have been proposed and get feedback before it's submitted or we understand what those next steps are really gonna be. Before, you know, we don't wanna submit it and then have it turned down. We need help along the process. So you know, we're still looking for volunteers to help with the subcommittee to help us write those. Um, uh, Denise, did anybody, Denise, did you have any feedback at all on um, an ad hoc subcommittee um, for an agricultural commission that you want to chime in on. I know that we had a discussion about it. I think that the EDC um, is willing to consider having an ad hoc underneath them, um, but it all needs to be discussed and taken to the next level. That's one takeaway from today. Do we have something more here? Okay. Uh, Stephanie Weaver, quick add in here. Yeah, just, just with what Joan was saying was the third part of her leg, I think it was the beginning of your speech, was um, this forum could be really good at getting the answer to what do farmers want to do. There's so many ideas out there in the county. I mean, there's so many different ways that people are uh, coming up with ideas. Uh, so what do farmers want to do if we could gather that information before we start drafting regulations to see if we can make a fit. I can put out another survey um, too that would be more specific on what people would actually want. Who in the room did the, filled out the survey? Okay, thank you. Okay, we do have the opportunity for more people to fill it out um, and maybe that is the next step. So we can put together another survey. We'll pick up the dialogue um, with the town about an ad hoc or some sort of a commission, agricultural commission, and you know, follow us on our Facebook page and give us feedback. We need help, we need support. Something like this can easily fizzle out and go right into the earth and we wouldn't even know it was like a bubbled up for a while, right? I mean, let's, let's keep this alive. Um, Harvey, do you have anything more to say? Anybody, anybody else? Last words, last words from our <laughs> board? All right, okay. Anything come in at all, Jillian? Oh, Amy says thank you for having her. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry for the technology issues, being able to hear you, but I feel like we made some good progress and um, we've made steps in the right direction. Thank you so much and a special thank you to you guys. Thank you. Raffle time? Oh, raffle, oh yes, how can we do that? Do we wanna keep, keep things going? Oh, how, how can I help? Who has raffle tickets? Who didn't get raffle tickets? Did you get a raffle ticket? Did you get a raffle ticket? Are they in your hat, Harvey? I got raffle tickets. Oh, here. okay. Can you just double check the last, last couple of people here? Somebody in this room came okay, up with an idea of their, a raffle. It was a ticket. good idea. Anybody who doesn't, just raise their hand. She's going to come over and get you a raffle ticket. We have we, a couple different things going on here. Okay. We put in names for people who are online and Zooming. Um, Kelly was busy assigning you a three-digit number, and you are in the hat. Guys, can you see me? You're in the hat. So when you, for Zoomers, you're also part of it. Oh, Karen needs, needs a one. raffle ticket. Kelly, can you? Yeah. Oops. Okay, bring Let the me pin. have Good another half for Karen. Okay, so we have a couple different things from, uh, so we're talking about a diversified community. We got great restaurants where we sell vegetables to Meraki, right? Meraki's given us a gift certificate. We got milk house chocolates. We love the milk house chocolate. You know, she smells the cows to know what kind of milk it's going to get. That's, what, what kind of story is that? That's a great story, right? Yeah. Individual stuff, right? right? Individual stuff. We have some Chanticleer Acre eggs. You know, no two eggs are the same, like no two farms are the same, right? Go figure. We got a great mushroom log that we did. Remember, Larry, when we did it with Jerry? Well, we got some. We got a big mushroom log, a blue oyster. It actually, it's gonna probably. What's it called? It. What's it do? And it blooms. It blooms. So it's gonna be blooming soon. 
And we got a cookbook from, from um, one of the local chefs, Eat Your Vegetables, Nancy Wolfson, is that her name? Nancy Wolfson. Nancy Wolfson, okay, do we have all things? So I know there's all kinds of ways to do this, but with pandemics, I guess there's new rules. So nobody really wants to stick their hand in here too much, but I can stick it and read it, right? Okay, so what's going first? How about the Chanticleer Acre eggs? Chanticleer Acre eggs, the number is, the last three numbers are 274. 274, that's our um, prefix from growing up in Watertown. 274, two, who four. has 274? Christine Minnelli. Christine Minnelli, who's Zoomer. zooming in. We got a Zoomer She's who a won Zoomer. Just eggs. Just her name on that. Okay, she can come by the, the hut. We'll make sure she gets them from Chanticleer Acres, right? Okay, that's, that's great. Let's see, what should we go, the Meraki? Sure, Meraki. How about Meraki? Here we go. All right, cross your fingers. Everybody's ready? Look at your numbers, guys. Okay, the next one is 282. 282. 282. Kelly? Bingo. Anybody have it in this building? That's Costa. Who? Costa. Costa. Costa from Chanticleer Acres. He does Working it. hard at the farm. It's not rigged. <laughs> it's not. He's you a, can see it's not. He's a okay. college kid and he needs this. This All will right. be good. I can be Vanna White for a second. Okay, you can be Vanna White. Well, kind of. Oh, Thorncrest chocolate. Did you give that away yet? Thorn nope, not yet. Oh, my gosh. I hope okay. I win that, but I didn't Here play. we go. This one's yours. Are you number 300? 300. Who's 300? 300. Man, these Zoomers, we shouldn't have been created. They had the Zoomers because it's like everybody that's, all right. Who's? Who? Lynn Alexander. Oh, Lynn Alexander. Lynn Alexander. Woo woo. She's a Zoomer. Zoomer. Oh, Looks boy. like it paid to Zoom. Okay. Don't forget, you guys all have this food over there, too. Okay. Well, we're. Is that it? Did you give the log away? No, no, not the log. We're going to do the log last. All right. How about the book? All right. Vegetables for breakfast from A to Z. You can have, actually have my marked up one, or we'll get the brand new one, which this won't be signed, my marked up one. This is signed copy. For me? Yeah, signed we'll get... copy. Okay. And the number is? She's going to be one of our teachers. 308. 308. 308. Another Zoomer? Hey, how many Zoomers do we have? Do you know Did how many Zoomers Did you put the, have? all the things in there? Dig at the bottom. Dig to the bottom. Uh, Who? Sephra. Oh, Sephra was here. Oh, she's still here? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, she's here. There she's you here. are. Congratulations. You, you win the Vegetables for Breakfast book. Signed. Vegetables for Breakfast. <laughs> Boom. How many, how many Zoomers do we have? Let's read her name on the back of it. How many? Oh, you don't know. Okay. Okay, this is a log. Watch her. She works out every day. Amy, what can you tell us about that log? It's heavy. Oh, it's a tree of heaven. It's a tree of heaven log that has been inoculated by blue oyster um, drain spawn, sawdust spawn, actually. And it, she started to produce a little There's bit. one right there. Blue oyster. She's waxed over. She's labeled. her to produce by bathing her in water and then bringing her out. And you can look, you can look at the date right here. It's going to see the date that we did it. Now, this is the log that started it all with us. This is a... 15,000 inoculated. 15,000. You want some mushrooms? Come to Chanticleer Acres. And here we go. Somebody feels lucky here, so it's not going to be a Zoomer. I like, I like Zoomers, but... Okay. 290. 290. 290. Another Zoomer. Another. Perfect. All right. All right that's it, guys. Okay, another reason to come to the Farmers Forum is because we'll have another, another raffle. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate everybody coming.